Oh, we all just, <laughs> and my dad's, life's not fair. We've heard that before. Life, in fact, in reality is just. It used to be in America that instead of complaining that others had nice things and forcing, it used to be that Americans, instead of complaining that others had nice things, they worked hard to have it themselves. It's changing in America now to where, for some, Americans demand that others give them of their nice things rather than earn it for themselves. It used to be in America that Americans worked hard to achieve their own personal goals, to achieve their own desires. One, of my, one, of, one car that I've always desired to have, and I've almost got it, it was a Subaru WRX STI. That's, that's my car. If you ever want to know what I want, if I would just ask God to give me one of these days, that's it. I've had a WRX, but it's not an STI, and there is a huge difference between the two. It may not be for some people, but there is for those who know what they're talking about. Y'all out there, this rain's making me have a good mood, man. I can feel it. It's good. There's a difference, and they would used to be that way. Remember the American dream? But actually, the American dream is slowly being eroded by ever-increasing covetousness. And that's what Jesus deals with here in our text this morning. And uh, even as tonight, we have to, this morning's title for this morning's message was Beware of Others' Things. Others, plural, possessive. Beware of Others' Things. We... We live in a world today, in a society today, where we're taught and we're being taught and children are being taught and the next generation is being taught that it doesn't necessarily matter if you make a million dollars because we will make sure that you're taken care of. We will make sure that you have everything that you need. If it, you don't necessarily need to get a high education to get a job because we're going we're gonna to bump up the minimum wage so that even if you start out at the bottom rung, you're already going to have a good income. Although... The more you raise it, the more expensive things become. It just kind of balances itself out. It used to be in society that if you wanted to work your way to the top or get to the top, you, you started out that way. When I began my job, one of my jobs at Six Flags Magic Mountain in California, I was working out there, and one of the things that they taught us, they showed us slides of it. The CEO of Six Flags Magic Mountain started his job as a ride operator. He just started there, and he just worked his way up. He started a minimum wage job. He was one of the few CEOs in America that started just in that same company, just a minimum wage, and he worked, 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 and he continued to improve himself and improve his education and continue to go in that industry, and the next thing you know, he was the CEO of that, of that company, not, not necessarily of all Six Flags, but of at least of that park, he was, he was head over it, and he worked his way up, but we're losing that in our society. We, we look around, and we see what everyone else has, and think to ourselves that, man, we've got to have that. And we're growing up in a society where hard work doesn't necessarily matter anymore so long as we can take from someone else. And we see covetousness is beginning to destroy our nation and our world. Jesus Christ begins to deal with that here in our text in Luke chapter number 12. And verse 13, he begins to uh, help us to understand we need to beware of covetousness of others or to be covetous of others. In verse 13, now, Jesus Christ had just be, had preached a message here in chapter 12, verse 2 down through verse number 12 about trusting God, about allowing God to take care of us, and, and God talking about the sparrows, and if God can take care of those, certainly He can take care of us. Verse number 7, the very hairs of your head are numbered for some of us. That count is a little bit lower than other people, but he's, God's talking about that. He's telling us that, uh, me and Brother, brother Hauser relate, right? Just because he grows his hair longer doesn't mean he has more of it than me. And uh, he, God's going to take care of us. He's going to provide for us. And in, in between these two messages, between verse number 12, and then as he begins, begins in verse number 22 to continue to preach, there's a, maybe a pause and uh, maybe a time for people to ask questions or whatever it is. And so a man of the company, the Bible says in 13, verse number 13, one of the company said unto him, Master, speak unto my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And we can see by context here that he's asking Jesus Christ to be a judge and, and to take care of him in the way that he desired it. He, he, he has, this, has this question of Jesus Christ that basically, let's put it in this way in our vernacular for today, Jesus, I want you to tell my brother that I want my fair share. Have we heard that in our world today? It's time for people to have their fair share or to give up their fair share. Jesus Christ, I, I want you to tell, your bro tell my brother to divide with me the inheritance. And 
The inheritance of the law at this time stated that the older brother would receive two-thirds and the younger brother would receive one-third of whatever the inheritance was. Later on in the next few chapters down, we'll see the, the parable of the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son? He said, Lord, give me my share now, and so I want to go. I want to go out and do my own thing, and so I want my share now. And so the father divided to that younger son his share. He would have received one-third which didn't make any sense because the father was not dead yet, which means he was going to continue to make money. So your one-third, if you just waited, would have been greater. But he took it. But the law stated at the time that when a father died and when he passed away, the inheritance would pass to the sons. The older would receive two-thirds and the younger one-third. And he was the older, he was the older son. He, he was worthy of it. The older son was then required to take care of the household. He was required to take care of the mother. He was required to take care of those. And so it, would, it made more sense then for him to receive a greater share because he had greater responsibility. The younger son would, yes, receive some, but he didn't have the same responsibility as the older son. But evidently, by our text here and by the way he asked, that the inheritance was quite a lot. And so he didn't believe that his share was enough. He, he wanted more of it. He saw what his brother received, and he wasn't content with what he justly received by the law and demanded that the richer give more to him. Does that sound familiar in our world today? In America today, to today, even the rich want the richer to give to them. We were watching, I was watching a clip the other day about this lady, and she was interviewing this uh, man, and he was a well-to-do man, and she was asking him, should the rich can give more money, and should we charge them more taxes? And he, was, he just said, hey, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that there's rich people today. I'm, I'm glad for those things. And he said, you're rich as well, but, and we should be happy about that. And she was trying to argue with him that, man, the rich should be paying more taxes. And he said, well, rich, which rich people, us rich people or the higher-up rich people? And she said, well, the higher-up rich people, they ought to give more taxes. So he's he kind of caught her, and so us rich people, we don't have to give more taxes, but the richer people have to give more taxes. You see, understand what I'm saying is, it's covetousness. It's not just the poor people of our world today that are covetous and looking to see everyone else. As long as someone else has more than us, that's what our nature, our flesh wants. We want even more of someone else's, and we know that the Bible says in Exodus, thou shalt not covet. And here was a man that demanded material wealth that he and his brother to be on equal financial planes. He, he wanted him to have the same that his brother had. He, he demanded a greater share of the inheritance that he neither earned nor had a legal right to. And yet he demanded that it be his. Jesus, master, demand, speak unto my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Oh, he'd listen to you, Jesus. You, you, have some, you have some authority here that if you would tell him, then maybe he would do it. Rather than go and work hard for himself, maybe make a better life for himself, maybe rather than being thankful and praising the Lord for the inheritance that he has and what he has, he'd know he, he demanded more. I, I want more, not, not for myself to grow, not for myself to expand myself, but no, I just want a more of someone else's stuff. He had the same philosophy that many have. They want to keep up with the Joneses next door. You remember, you heard that phrase before, that's an old one. So I'm old, so keeping up with the Jones next door. I want more stuff. But First Timothy chapter six verse ten says, "Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content." Hebrews thirteen five says, "And let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have." For he saith, "I will never leave thee nor forsake thee." It's amazing how many folks in America today complain that they're struggling. And my wife and I, having lived in a third world country, we just encourage people. Oh, you, you think you have a bad? I'll take you some places in Argentina, and you will be a rich individual. Rich individual. There's still places in Argentina where the mom sweeps the dirt floor still where they have nothing, where the government has decided and declared when we were still there that everybody in the house could live off six pesos a person. So if you had, so welfare, they're going to give you, if you had a family of four, they'd give you 24 pesos a day. That should be enough to feed your family. 24 pesos a day was basically about $3 in American money. 3 to $4, depending on the exchange. They could live off of that. 
And that was fine. That was enough to go down. They could buy, they could probably buy about a half pound of spaghetti, or they could get some bread, and they could get a little bit of, of jelly. They could get maybe a bag of milk or something like that. And that's what they that's what the government said. You can survive off that. So you that's that's fine. That's what we're gonna give you. Try that in America today. Yet yet we, we're so covetous. Yet we desire more. Yet, yet we desire more of other people. But God says. We live in such a great place. Be thankful that you're not in the rain today. I can promise you there's probably people in this world that it's leaking on them. It's leaking on them. And yet we want more. Yet we want more. The other day where we were passing out tracks yesterday, there were some big houses we were passing out tracks. The houses had guests. They, were, they had a two-car garage, and then they had either another two-car garage where they turned into a guest house, and it was two stories. And it was amazing. It was, it was, these were big houses, my wife and I. My sons were passing out these tracks with yesterday, and, and we're thinking to ourselves, and we watched a show yesterday where the guy did a tour of an 8,000-square-foot two-story apartment in Miami had its own clear pool all this kind of stuff it had TVs that came so we had window all two walls were windows you could see out on the ocean and so was, instead they had a 64 inch TV that was inside the ceiling so if you want to watch TV it would blah, come out of the ceiling and come down and drop down and when you went back up it was amazing it was fabulous 8,000 square feet they only wanted 18.5 for it million five for it our house would have fit in the living room. Our entire house would have fit in the living room. But you know what? Still got a roof over my head. I still have a car in the garage. It's not an STI, but I do have a car in the garage. We're, we're not content. Here, here was this individual. He said, Master, speak unto him. Did he divide the inheritance with me? I've been given what's legally supposed to be mine. I, I've been given really what I didn't earn. Inheritance is what your parents, what they leave for you. In reality, it's, it's what you didn't earn. It's, 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 just, it's for you to have, yes. But he didn't earn this. He, he, didn't, he didn't do anything but just be the son. And yet he wanted more. He, he wasn't content with what God had given him. He wasn't content with what God had decided to provide him with. God may decide to provide someone else with a nicer car than me, a bigger house than me. But so what? That's not what God wants for me to have. Just be content with what I have in my life. The stern reply in verse number 14, it's interesting. He doesn't say to him, son. He doesn't say to him, friend. He just says, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? You, you can almost sense the sarcasm. You can almost sense the frustration in Jesus. He just preached the message about trusting in Christ, being thankful for the basic needs that God provides for us. And here some comes, somebody comes right after the invitation and says, man, I'm just, it's just not fair. Are you listening at all? He responds with an unusual title for this individual. He just calls, he just says, man, are you not listening at all? Did you, did you not hear the message that was just preached? He, he said, he, he didn't come here to settle earthly disputes. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. He wasn't here to make people richer. He wasn't here to give them a better, a better physical life in that sense. He, he did come to preach faith and trust in God. That's what he came for. Jesus had just finished this sermon. And he had heard none of it. He had only heard what he wanted to hear. He, he wanted Jesus to solve his physical problems, his physical needs. In reality, he may not even have had a need. He didn't say how much his older brother had. didn't say how much he had. His older brother could have had $2 million, and he got, his older brother could have got $3 million, and he could have got $1 million. But that's just not enough. I need more. I want more. There's no complaint that he's barely getting by. There's no complaint here that, that he doesn't know where his next meal is going to come from. No, no, I just, I just want more. I just need more. I just, it's just not fair. I've got to have more. It's not fair that he has more than me. But Jesus Christ, that, that's not what I came for. He wants him to understand there in verse number 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Life is not about how much we possess when we die or when we come to our life. Life is about whether or not we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior. Life is about eternal life. Life is about what we have after this. When we pass away from this physical life, where will we be? That's what's important. When we pass from this life, we'll end up in two places, one of two places, heaven or hell. Life consists of getting to heaven. Everlasting 
life. It doesn't matter how much we have. It doesn't matter. Remember, the rich man died and he went to hell, but the poor man, Lazarus, where did he go? He went into Abraham's bosom. He went to heaven. He had all the poverty on this earth, and yet he still had everlasting life. Is it good to have good things and nice things? Yes. Jesus Christ didn't condemn this man for not having. He condemned this man for his focus being in the wrong place. His focus was just about having more. His focus was just about increasing his own physical wealth. His own, his own focus was just about fairness, not salvation. Not about his spiritual life. You see, more income does not equal financial freedom. Let that sink in a minute. It doesn't equal financial freedom. Have you ever thought about it like this? I mean, you know, maybe God hasn't given you a million dollars because you couldn't handle a million dollars. I mean, if you can't handle what God's given you in your salary right now, why would he give you more? It's going to hurt you even more. I, my father-in-law has given a story about a couple that came to him and came to him for some spiritual advice. And I mean, they were they were underwater, and so he was helping them with their budget, and he was helping them with their budget, and just, man, getting everything worked out, and, and first of all, they weren't tithing, so that was the biggest reason why they were struggling financially, because they weren't tithing and giving to missions, and so they got that figured out first, and so then he started to solve some things and start helping them with the things, and they, well, preacher, you know, if we just, if we could just double our income, we could just take care of all of this, and he said, okay, to help you learn, I'm going to pray that God will double your income because obviously you're not learning from here so a year later they came and met with him and praise the lord god doubled their income but you know what they were in more financial troubles than they were before when they had the twenty thousand. why because they weren't content with what god had already given them and they desired and desired and desired and coveted more and more and more and they forgot what was more important their spiritual life their walk with god their, their service to the Lord. That was more important. God says, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of things which he possessed. Again, God's not saying it's even wrong to have an abundance of possessions. Many of God's people in the Bible had many possessions. Abraham was a wealthy man. Job was a wealthy man. But it wasn't about those things. What did Job say? Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return. My life is not based on what I have and what others have and, and how it's not fair that other people have that I don't have no my life is what is my walk with God what is my spiritual life do I have Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior is my family walking with the Lord is my family faithful to the Lord am I doing what I should do for the Lord is that first in my life he said take heed of covetousness it's not a new warning Exodus chapter 20 verse 17 thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. If God gives your neighbor a Maserati and he gives you a Ford, praise the Lord. I believe you're probably living in the wrong neighborhood, but so be it. I've told you about the time when my wife and I went to a church in Newport Beach and we're driving our minivan around and all these exotic cars are around us. It is awkward driving a Nissan Quest between all these cars. It is awkward being in a drive through at Taco Bell behind a, what was a Ferrari that one time? Ferrari at Taco Bell drive through Just let that sink into a while. It's insane. I told her, we are, we're definitely going to wash the car and shine the tires at least. At least make it look nice. You see, covetousness, it means a strong, inordinate desire of obtaining and possessing some supposed good, usually in a bad sense, and it's applied to an inordinate desire of wealth or avarice. And have you ever thought about it like this? This is why we covet. I love this. New things become old things, then old things become new again. Let that sink in for a second. I'll, I'll read it again. Some of y'all are looking at me confused, and I'll explain it. New things become old things, meaning I want a new thing. I got to have a new thing. I want a new car. But then after about six months, what happens? I want a new car. I need a new thing. Because every six months, they come out with a new body style or a new theme. So it becomes an old thing. But then after a while, guess what? It becomes new now. A 68 Corvette could be worth $100,000. So new things become old things. And then old things become new things. And it's just a never-ending cycle. You remember what you used to wear when you were a teenager? Come on. 
Some of y'all are thinking about it, and now it's all coming back. It's all coming back because things are become new for a while. But it's all really just covetousness. It's just covetousness. Oh, man, I remember when I was a teenager, I had this car when I was a teenager. I got to get me that car again because that's what I need to have. It's $100,000, but I got to have that car. Covetousness. I wrote in my notes here, if you had a million dollars and died, what good did it do you? What good did it do you? Did it save you? Did it help you? When you stand before God, Lord, I got me a million dollars. Lord's going to look around. Um, do you see heaven? This place is pure gold. The walls are made of, the gates of the city are made out of one solid pure pearl. I mean, a million dollars is nothing. What, what, do, what good does it do? Ecclesiastes 5.10, if a man will not be satisfied with silver. Proverbs 27, verse 24, for riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. Life does not consist in what a man has on earth, but what a man has in heaven. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? That's what's most important. None of this means, again, that Christians cannot have, but rather means that Christians should be wary of desiring more than what God gives them. If God gives you what you need, praise the Lord. God may not be giving you the top menu item at Cheesecake Factory, but the fact that you can sit in there and eat an appetizer, praise the Lord, you're there. I want you to think about this. Remember, there will always be someone who possesses more than you. Always. We have a gentleman that comes to our boxing gym. He comes to our boxing gym and he drives up in his Audi RSX8. $157,000 Audi. It is a nice car. I have my Subaru Forester. But you know what? My Forester can do a whole lot more than that thing can do. Now, nothing can go fast, but my car can go up in the mountains, can do all kinds of things, and it can haul all my kids. I could jam my kids in that Audi, but we'd have to bend them like a pretzel to get in the back. There's always somebody that has something more. I looked it up today just to, just to look it up. The most expensive iPhone is a gold-plated iPhone with diamond studs. It's $7.2 million, and it's a functioning phone always going to be something more if we we'll allow ourselves to look always going to be something more my wife and i we hang on to our phones forever when i traded my phone in here to texas i had an s5 the god gentleman that traded the phone he said i didn't even know these still existed <laughs> you know i said it still works <laughs> still works there's always something more have you ever seen the lines at the phone places, every time a new phone comes out, people are around the block, and their old phone functions just perfectly fine. But they got to have the new thing, the new thing, the new thing, the new thing, the new thing. I challenge you to look up the average Arizonan liquid debt. I'm not talking about houses or anything secure. It's well over sixty thousand dollars is the average liquid debt for Arizonans. Average. How many of those are Christians? It's become, hey, I just need this, and I want that, I want this, I want that, I want this. Beware. Second thing we see in verse number 16 through 21, we also see covetousness of self. Picture it as a man that is aggressively self-centered. Between the verses 16 through 21, you see the word I six times. You see the word my five times. He was a man who was all self-centered. It was about himself. He, he coveted everything for himself. It, he, he only looked into himself. He, he coveted the best for himself. And this was a man that was going to be pictured by this individual here. All he thought about was himself. He looked around and he saw what everyone else has. But then there's also that individual that looks and just looks to himself and looks to covet for himself. This was a man in verse number 16, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a rich, certain rich man brought forth plentifully. I want you to understand, just because you have doesn't mean you don't covet. The certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room to bestow my fruits? Do you think he thinks about himself quite a bit? Do you think he desires for himself 
Do you think he wants for himself? This is the kind of individual that if he was married, his wife struggles while his husband has every gun known to the planet. Thinks about himself. Thinks about himself. Guys, if you like lots of guns, marry a woman that likes lots of guns, and then you don't have to worry about it. Go to the Rutgers house. They're just laying everywhere. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's what it is. He wanted it for himself. But here was his problem. He didn't thank God for his blessings. You see, man cannot control the produce from the earth. Technology may help, but God controls. And here was a man that thought within himself. He, he thought, man, my ground, my place brought forth my fruit plentifully. He wasn't the one that brought the rain. He wasn't the one that brought the sunshine. He wasn't the one that took care of the bugs. He wasn't the one that did all those things. God did that for him. He had a ground that produced plentifully. And what a blessing that it was plentifully. But he was a man who thanked himself for what but I guess he thought he produced for himself. Man, I, I do such a good job at my work, and I'm so glad that I can produce all this for myself. But who gave us the ability to do those things? Who gave us the ability? My wife does data entry all day long, just typing. I call her in the afternoon just to call her to see what she's doing. I can't hear nothing because all she's doing, she sets her phone by there, puts the speaker on, and she's just going like this. I'm like, pick up your phone so I can talk to you. You know what God did? She didn't have that job because she's such a typist. God gave her that ability. God provided that ability to do those kind of things. It wasn't something that he had accomplished for himself. He, he thought within himself. It's notice here. He didn't seek God's advice. He didn't seek his scriptural responsibility. He didn't consider any of this to be God. No, he was all his. He thought about what he should do for himself, not what does God want me to do. Consider this. Consider that God may have blessed you for what you could do for someone else. He was an individual. And we can see, even by the context, as Jesus gives us this parable, that even if the ground didn't produce plentifully, even if he didn't produce a, a, bountiful, cro a bountiful crop, I'm going to get that out, a bumper crop, he still had enough for himself to provide for himself. And he never considered that maybe God gave me this extra so that I can give it away. So that I can just provide it for someone else. He didn't consider that maybe my next door neighbor, maybe the next farm over, his farm didn't produce bountifully. I got a bumper crop. I don't need this bumper crop, but he does. Lord, who do you want me to give it to? Who do you want me to provide this for? Who do you want me to go? I don't have enough barns to put this stuff in, but I may know someone who has empty barns who needs it to be filled. Remember the church in Acts? The church in Acts, they were bringing everything they had. Not to fill their own houses, not to make themselves greater, but they were bringing it to church to do what? To give to everyone else who had needs and even doing it. He, he thought, he, did, he didn't think, what does God want me to do? He thought himself there in verse number 18 and verse number 17, what shall I do? He didn't say, God, what do you want me to do? God, thank you for this extra blessing. No, he looked in the mirror and said, man, woof, what are you going to do for yourself? What are you going to provide for? Well, how are you going to take care of yourself? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. It wasn't his fruits. They were God's fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Again, his previous barns were more than sufficient to provide for his needs and take care of him. He wasn't just getting by. God says he was rich. He already had more than he needed. What, what, what more did he, he, did he ever could provide for? I, I, it just blows my mind, these sports players. They, they get a contract for, let's just throw some stuff out, 10 years. And they're going to get like $80 million for 10 years. And I'm just thinking to myself, what are they going to do with all that? What possibly can they do? I'm living just fine. God's taking care of all my needs. I have a nice house. I have a nice car. I have a nice family. I have food in the pantry, and I'm not even making even point whatever fraction of $80 million. Think, and yet they want more, and 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 more. Not satisfied. No, it's, it's for me, it's, it's for myself. 
He, and he never once considered that God may have blessed him, not for him, but that he could give it to someone else. There may have been a needy family nearby who could have used it to get by. I remember when we were in Towner, North Dakota, we had a little goat farm. Milked our own goats and did everything. We didn't have a whole lot of crops or anything like that. And our farmer, next door neighbor, uh, it was kind of a, it was one of our rougher years and it was everything cost went up and just, he just out of the blue just, just came over and he brought us a big giant bale, just a whole bale of hay. And he said, you know, I know you guys are kind of struggling trying to get going. I just want to give you guys this bale of hay. That bale of hay was expensive. It lasted us for a couple of years. Our cats loved it. They dug little holes in it and they went inside of it and they would live in there. But we could feed those goats for the next two years. It was, it was an awesome blessing. The farmer next door just came and said, I just want to give this to you. We have extra bales. I know you guys are just trying to get started. Here, have it. But that's not what this guy did. He said, no, 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 no. I, I need to build bigger for myself. He didn't claim God for the fruit. He, he didn't thank God for the blessings. He didn't claim God for the fruit. You see, in his mind, he didn't need God to help him. There are so many Christians who are so smart, they don't need God to help them with their finances or possessions. No, I can figure it out for myself. I can figure out my own retirement program. I can figure out my own 401k. I can provide for my own finances. I can set my own budget. I don't need God to help me with anything in my finances because I'm educated. I'm smart. I can do this for myself. I don't need God at all. This man was a workaholic. He said, i got to build me bigger barns. I got, I'm going to do everything I can for myself. He, he sacrificed God in order to please his self. He was a selfish individual. He was covetous of his self. He, he did need it to keep it all for himself. If you notice in, my, in the text here, he says, my fruits, my goods. I wrote this in my notes. You know, so long as your stuff is your stuff, you'll never be happy with your stuff. Say that again. As long as your stuff is your stuff, you'll never be happy with your stuff. Why is there so many storage units everywhere? Some people have a legitimate need. They don't have a garage, so they got to rent a storage space. <clears throat> but most storage units are full of junk that people don't even need anymore. And they don't even know what they have. They just, I got to have, oh, that's nice. Let me buy that. Oh, that's nice. I got to buy that. I had to teach my wife just because it's on sale doesn't mean you have to buy it. That's why they have sales. Oh, it's on sale. That means it's a good deal. We got to have it. Why? Why do we got to have it? Because it's, it's on sale. It's on sale. Got to have it. Got to have it. Got to buy it. We're not happy. But you know, as long as it's God's stuff, well, thank you, Lord. Thank you for providing me a house to live in. It's your house. Thank you for providing me a car to drive. It's your car. Thank you for those kind of things. Thank you for providing me with a suit and tie to wear on Sunday. It's your stuff. Thank you for that. Thank you. Job chapter 31, verse 24 through 25 and 28. If I have made, if I have made gold my hope, or have said to the fine gold, thou art my confidence... If I rejoice because my wealth was great and because mine hand hath gotten this, this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied God that is above. If you don't spend time thanking God for your job, you're covetous of yourself. If you haven't thanked God for the opportunity to eat at McDonald's, you're covetous of yourself. If you haven't thanked God for the things that you have in your house, you're covetous of yourself. Fathers, you got to teach your children to be givers. You got to teach them to give. You got to teach them to be thankful and understand where your stuff came from. You got to do it. You got to teach them that. Isaiah 56, verse 11 Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look their own way, everyone for his gain from his quarter. We find lastly, he didn't need to give himself to God. When the, child, when the Christian does not surrender to God, the Christian does not trust God, trusts himself. Psalms 52 verse 7, Lo, this is the man that 
made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. It's sin when we trust in our self. It's sin when we keep it to our self. It's sin when we hold it for our self. I mean, he didn't think to be generous. Verse number 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool, thy night, thy soul, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth not up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. What he had before was sufficient. His barns were big enough and he had plenty of space to bestow for himself. Again, God was not condemning this man for being rich. He was not. In fact, God blessed this man. God gave him more. But God had a requirement for him. It's not wrong to have, but it is wrong to hoard. We think to ourselves, oh, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. I want to keep it for me. The key phrase in this entire, in this entire parable is, not rich towards God. Proverbs eleven twenty four. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but attendeth to poverty. He was a fool, God said. Jeremiah 17, verse 11. And as the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days. At the end shall be a fool. He gave not, this man gave not a single thought to others. He was opposite of the members of the church in Acts. Remember, they thought about everyone else before themselves. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. If one covets it all and dies with it all, how foolish is that? How foolish is that? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11 through 14 and 17. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full, hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds are multiplied and thine heart be lifted up, excuse me, and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And say in thine heart, my power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. Man must beware, lest he lust for his own happiness instead of pleasing God. Happy people are content people. Happy rich people are content people as well. Philippians 4.11, not that I speak, speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, Therewith to be content. First Timothy chapter six, verse six through eight, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. My friends, God may have given you much, praise the Lord. But it's not about you. It's not about others. It's about God. God may have given you much so that you can give much. God may have given you a little to trust in him more. But either way, it's all about him. Because you see, life consists of not in the abundance of things which a man possesseth. In reality, it should all be his anyway. It's all his. If God gives my wife and I another car, it's his his not mine it's his if god decides to move us into a trailer park it's all his it doesn't matter it's all his it's all his if god decides to move us into a house like we were passing out the other day with a guest house making it into a missions apartment and house missionaries it's all his it's all his either way it's all his every head bowed and every eye closed this morning beware of others things how about you today? Most important thing to consider is do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior? Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. 
of one thing that you can covet, that's everlasting life, and that you should covet. If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, my friends, you're on your way to a place called hell. That's the reality. That's the truth. If you've never called upon Christ and forgiveness of your sins, accepting him as your Lord and personal Savior, you're on your way to a place called hell. And God says, I want to give you everlasting life. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open, I will come in, sup with him, and he with me. I want you to be born again. I want you to know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. But Christian, when was the last time you came to the altar and just thanked God for what you have? Just thanked him for what you have? God may have given you much, and God may have given you little, but at least you have. God may have given you much in order to be a blessing to God. God says you're a fool if you're not rich towards God with what you're given, what he's given you. It's not about you, it's about him. It's not about being equal with our next door neighbor. It's about being right with God. It's about our life with God. What's your walk with Christ? We weren't even talking about tithing. None of this had to do with tithing. Tithing is not sacrifice. Tithing is not being rich toward God. Tithing is being obedient. God says this is going above and beyond that. This is our relationship with him. This is our commitment to him. This is our love for him. This was our walk with him. How about you today?